Thanks, everyone, for coming today. My name is Anna Kastner, and I'm a postgraduate legal fellow at the Criminal Justice Program of Study, Research, and Advocacy. And we're very excited to see so many people here for our second to last installment in the series Race, Place, and Policing, What We Can Learn from Baltimore. Um, throughout the series, we've been talking about issues of race and policing through a number of different lenses. And today we're going to focus on education. Um, I also wanted to make a quick plug for our final event of the series, which will be on Monday evening at 5.30 p.m. in Wasserstein 2009. We'll have a number of advocates from Baltimore come to talk about the work they do and various modes of lawyering that they employ. So we'll have folks from the ACLU of Maryland, the Public Defender's Office, uh, community activists, and um, a state legislator. So I hope to see many of you at that event as well. All of the events are being recorded, and they're available to watch on our website, which is cjp.law.harvard.edu. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Andres Alonso to um, give our second to last lecture in the series. Um, Mr. Alonso is a graduate of Harvard Law School, and he is also the former CEO of the Baltimore Public School System. He was there from 2006 to 2013. No, Seven. 2007, I'm sorry. And um, he is currently a professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Alonzo. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm pleased and uh, I know there's so many of you here today. And uh, before I start, I just want to ask, uh, is there anybody here who's from Baltimore City? Yeah. Uh, from the public schools? Yeah. Which school? City, okay. Uh, uh, they're oldest uh, high school in the nation. <laughs> there, yeah. Uh, anyone else? Anybody who's worked in the Baltimore City Schools? No? Great. So uh, uh, a couple of thoughts about uh, uh, just my being here today, which is that uh, I was CEO in Baltimore City Public Schools from July 2007 to uh, end of June. 2013. And ever since I've left, I have been uh, very, very careful about uh, uh, talking about Baltimore City and uh, uh, having exchanges about Baltimore City. Part of it is because it's, it's, it's still personal and raw for me. Uh, it's still unprocessed in some ways. Uh, and also part of it because I've, I've always struggled with questions of representativeness and uniqueness in the context of how people talk about schools and how people talk about cities and school systems. Uh, so as an example of that, uh, when I was offered the job in uh, Baltimore City, I, uh, the fourth season of The Wire had just run on HBO, which was about the schools. And uh, the first thing that somebody told me was, well, watch The Wire if you want to learn about what's happening in the schools in Baltimore City. And what I told them was, absolutely not. I mean, <laughs> if I'm going to be fair and just and, uh, uh, and really understand what's going on in Baltimore City, I'll, I'll learn it from the place. Uh, I still haven't watched The Wire, even though uh, people tell me that it is an extraordinary uh, work of art, I will at some point, but I struggle with that element of, of uh, especially a place like Baltimore that seems so symbolic and symptomatic, uh, and, uh, and at the same time, paradoxically, a place that if you're from Baltimore, people will tell you that Baltimore is unique. So I, I struggle with what it means to have uh, this conversation. So when the incidents last spring happened, and you know, we can call it as uh, uh, Jason said during the first speaker uh, event, you know, the warning, the unrest, the riot, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I, you know, when I was being inundated by the, you know, do you want to comment? What do you want to say? 
uh, I held back, and my my only exchange, public exchange, was uh, a a podcast that I taped for the Graduate School of Education, and I called it "Why I Love Baltimore." And uh, uh, some of that, uh, uh, you know, feeling of embrace, uh, which of course, you know, love always comes with uh, a component which is about grief and. Uh, loss, uh, you know, you'll, you'll get some of that in, uh, in this brief talk, even though I plan to talk for only about 30 minutes and then give you lots of oxygen so that we can uh, go a little deeper into your concerns. So a little bit about uh, uh, the context, since this is about race and place, and, you know, by definition it's about context. Uh, uh, part of one of the things that is unique uh, for, it was unique for me about Baltimore when I was when I arrived was this, you know, extraordinary sense of of something having been lost that I experienced from uh, people in Baltimore, uh, regardless of their color uh, or uh, class around the school system. Uh, you know, this is a place that uh, had, as I just mentioned, the third oldest high school in the nation the oldest girls, all girls high school in the nation, uh, the oldest African-American high school in the nation, the first vocational technical high school in Maryland, the, uh, I think the oldest football rivalry among uh, high schools, Pali City, high schools in the nation, a place where people, when, they, when you ask them, uh, uh, where, where did you graduate from? Uh, where did you study? They don't tell you that they went to Harvard or Princeton or, or University of Maryland. They flash their high school ring. So uh, my friend here, I'm sure, flashes his ring uh, when he goes home uh, during the summer. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, it's not necessarily about the elite high schools. It doesn't matter which high school. There's a, there's, there's a sense of belonging to a place, a community that I found uh, quite extraordinary. Uh, with that sense of belonging and that sense of loss, a, a fairly troubled and problematic history that, is, that doesn't seem of a piece with uh, uh, that sense of connection. So uh, as you know, and you know, this question of whether Baltimore is southern or northern, northern was uh, a topic in one of the earlier talks. Uh, Baltimore had a segregated school system until 1954. The, uh, the first breach of that uh, legal segregation happened in 1952, actually, ahead of uh, the Brown decision, when uh, the A track in Baltimore Polytechnic, an extraordinary elite school in Baltimore, was uh, integrated because there wasn't a similar track in the rest of the schools in the city. In 54, uh, the district enters a voluntary desegregation plan. So it avoids uh, some of the uh, legal tensions of other cities in the nation. And uh, the city gets, the school system gets desegregated. And in the following 10 to 14 years, part of what happens is uh, the building of new schools. Uh, uh, strategically placed so that they could bridge certain neighborhoods. Uh, the creation of schools that people still flash their rings around, Edmondson, Northwest, and High School in different parts of the city. Uh, a, a gentleman named Howell Baum has written this uh, really interesting book about the segregation in Baltimore called Brown in Baltimore that I recommend that you read, uh, he thinks of the voluntary plan as, as, as a huge failure that uh, was driven by a liberal ideology that uh, failed to be equal to the deeper structural elements that were at play in the city. I will also recommend uh, a, an astonishing book called Black Social Capital, The Politics of Education Reform in of School Reform in Baltimore, 1986 to 1999, which I read 
as, as my Bible when I uh, was walking into Baltimore. Uh, I think that leadership is in some ways anthropology, in some ways archaeology. And, uh, uh, you know, I found uh, all kinds of symbols and signs or, on, and palimpsests in, uh, in that book, and I recommend that you read it as well. The focus of the book is the creation of elites, black and white, in Baltimore, and what happened around the creation and the loss of social capital uh, around the schools and the compromises made around the schools over decades in Baltimore, not simply in that decade. And uh, if, if, you, if you're going to talk about what's possible in schools, you need to talk about social capital both in communities and both in schools themselves. So I recommend those two books. I will also recommend, and I mentioned this to Anna earlier, uh, on uh, uh, a text written in 1991 by a professor at the Kennedy School called Mark Moore called Race, Violence, and Policing, which uh, uh, I found almost prescient of uh, the present conversation about the interaction between what was happening in the 1980s about the increase in violence and incarceration, how the police was responding and the extraordinarily ambivalent response by communities towards the push and pull between the aggressive police practices and the beginning of what became known later as community or problem-solving policing. So uh, I'll refer to those texts at some point uh, later uh, in the talk, but you know they, they are a good beginning if you want to go deeper into anything that I'm going to say uh, today. So from 1990, from 1954 to roughly 1968, a period of huge growth in this newly integrated school system, Baum already sees, but at a glacier pace, some of the elements that came into play afterwards but a period of growth. So by 1968, Baltimore, a city that at that point had a million residents, had a school system with 182,000 182, students, right? In 1968, you have the riots, and you know, Jason led his, uh, his uh, uh, talk with the difference between the 1968 riot in the 19, the 2015, 14 unrest, as in, you know, a thousand fires versus 60, et cetera, et cetera. But in the aftermath of the 68 riots, what you have is a pattern of enrollment decline with both white and black uh, middle class flight that over a period of roughly 40 years means the loss of over 100,000 enrolled students in the school system. So when I entered the school system, the first thing that I did is I asked for the data. And uh, because I'm a highly skeptical person, you know, when I'm looking at increased test scores, and test scores have been increasing in the four or five years before I arrived, what I then look at is the end, what's happening with the number of kids being tested. And I see a decline of roughly two to 2,500 uh, uh, two kids uh, every year in terms of the number of kids being tested. And I go, is somebody gaming here? And what I then learn is, no, that's the, that's the pattern. We're losing 3% of our population, student population every single year. So by the time I arrived in 2007, you have a school system that was overwhelmingly African-American and poor. Uh, roughly 87% uh, of the students were African-American, 84, 85% of the students were African-American. Uh, roughly 87% of the kids were eligible for, for free and reduced meal. That number is actually an undercounting because high school kids do not bring lunch forms back. So if you actually think of real numbers, the poverty numbers were much higher. There were pockets of white students in the school system. You had some in the elite high schools. 
There were four of them, uh, City, Poly, Western for girls, and the Baltimore School of the Arts. They had a disproportionate number of students enrolled than in other uh, exam schools in other cities because Baltimore has always believed in the talented 10th in ways that were problematic around the concentration of achievement and poverty in other places, as in if the uh, exam schools were not accepting 5% of the students, but they were accepting 15% of the students, then you ended up with some high schools where the entire ninth grade class uh, was not meeting standards. There were also pockets of white students in, uh, in some parts of the city. Uh, uh, in Brooklyn, uh, neighborhood in Baltimore, not simply in New York, and not artisanal, is on the other side of the river uh, with deep poverty, uh, uh, as poor as Sandtown, in a way. Uh, uh, all the neighborhoods where you had pockets and, uh, and some schools that were beginning to be integrated around the an emerging uh, charter sector that was being very deliberate about where they were placing schools. So you had charters mostly in the east side where you had a growing Latino population and growing gentrification. And then you also had charters in the northeast in Lauraville uh, where you also had a growing uh, middle class gentrification process going on. Hardly any charter schools in the west side of town where you had uh, the deepest uh, uh, poverty. In uh, 1983, uh, a, a special education case called Von G uh, is filed that last 26 years. And it is relevant because when I walk into Baltimore, one of the first things that I said, having come from New York, where I was, uh, had been deputy chancellor, was why is in Baltimore under mayoral control? It's a, you know, it's a huge uh, uh, injection of accountability in a place which is uh, <coughs> screaming for uh, uh, leveraging and uh, alignment around what is happening in all the systems at play around schools. And part of what I was told is that while the special education is going on, no one will touch the school system because it was so problematic. The state had attempted to take over 11 schools in the, in the district in 2006 in the middle of a gubernatorial race that pitted the then mayor of Baltimore, Martin O'Malley, lately a presidential candidate, against the then Republican governor of Maryland, Bob Ehrlich. Uh, and the, the, the politicization of what had been a state attempt to assert accountability in a host of schools, 11 schools, mostly middle schools, in, uh, in Baltimore, uh, uh, essentially brought out the, that deep sense of connection and pride that coexists in Baltimore with, with a really critical stance around civic institutions in Baltimore, the, uh, the governor backed off. What's ironic about the takeover is that in 1997, through an act of the legislature that was signed by the mayor of Baltimore, the city had handed over control of the school system to a, what, is, what was in essence a partnership, a joint partnership of the uh, city and the state. So the Baltimore school system is governed by a board of commissioners that are jointly appointed by the mayor and by the governor uh, after recommendations from a state board that is uh, appointed by the governor. So you had, you had a body that was in some ways already taken over with a takeover attempt by the State Department of Education. And part of what had triggered the takeover attempt was how fundamentally ineffective the school system had been up to that time. So between two, 1997 and 2007, when I was appointed, I was the seventh CEO in those 10 years. You had a pattern of incremental growth in uh, 
uh, test scores, but still uh, a, a system that was clearly broken. Only 21% of the kids were testing at proficient or above in eighth grade math. Uh, uh, in tests that are not the present uh, common core tests. Uh, so uh, a huge, huge uh, uh, questions about the capacity of the school system to respond to the needs of students in the city even after the state and the city had joined hands to intervene in a context where funding for the, for the schools had been increasing for roughly five years for the first time in roughly four decades. So if you go back to the 1990s, and one of the reasons why the city agreed to the handover of control was the inability of the city to fund the schools. You, you know, the city had a horrendous 1980s and 90s. Uh, you had the, and you guys probably have many more details than I do about this because I haven't been here in uh, over 30 years. But the, uh, the, the change in the incarceration laws, uh, you know, coupled with the, uh, the, the rise in, in, in the drug trade in American inner cities, uh, led to uh, a generation that was, in essence, shut out from uh, opportunity. And uh, uh, that continues through the 90s. So, you know, we struggle, for example, to hire men from Baltimore because of uh, uh, the need to, for them to pass uh, background checks. Uh, the, the, the interaction between some of the laws, the, the extraordinary rise in uh, incarceration uh, uh, had extraordinary effect around what was happening in the city, uh, around families. Uh, it also interacted with the deindustrialization of the city, especially around inner city neighborhoods, which also feeds this, this uh, sense of loss and regret that is a part of so many conversations about Baltimore. And uh, uh, in 1987, the city hands over control. It takes roughly seven years for the state to actually start making good on its promise of significantly increasing funding. And that promise, uh, it's, it's that, that making good on the promise is not voluntary. It follows the, uh, the filing of a lawsuit, the Bradford litigation by the ACLU with the Baltimore school system as a, as a co-plaintiff, which then generates a political compromise. The, work on school funding by the Thornton Commission, which creates new formulas for the funding of all school systems in Maryland. So what had originally uh, started as a claim by the Baltimore City uh, schools and city that, that uh, state funding was unjust and insufficient for Baltimore becomes a much larger conversation which by necessity leaves a lot less for Baltimore because uh, as some of you might know, uh, insufficiency standards are quite ambiguous because when it comes to funding questions, it's always about how much money is available and if the amount of money going into education increases radically and it goes to many, many people, then what the city could have gotten uh, was by necessity reduced. The bottom line for the school system, however, is that over a stretch of roughly four to five years, for the first time ever, the school system is getting roughly 50 to $60 million more every single year baselined into its budget. So you have an increase in state aid of roughly $300 million at a time when the city contribution remains completely flat. The city contribution doesn't change in 15 years, which creates this extraordinary imbalance between what can be done in the city, 
politically and operationally independently of a larger state conversation around politics where Baltimore is completely alone and sui generis. Uh, you know, I, we always said that Baltimore was the hole in the donut with the uh, suburbs as the donut during a time when the political power of the city, which had once been immense, declined significantly because of the decline in the larger population. The city went from a million people to 600,000 people, which meant a proportionate loss in uh, the number of people in Annapolis who were ready to advocate and vote for Baltimore City, which was also accompanied by a redrawing of zone of boundaries, district boundaries, which at a certain point meant that if you were a legislator from Baltimore City, you were representing Baltimore City uh, geographically, which was very, very different than 20, 30 years ago when if you were representing Baltimore City, you were also representing parts of the counties. It, it le that had led to the pursuit of the yes, share agreements. Once Baltimore was all about Baltimore, in some ways it ensured a kind of cohesion about uh, how people felt around certain issues, but in a way that, was, that it was always very isolated in relationship to how the rest of the state saw the issues, with the state insistently uh, uh, claiming that, that it had in many ways done its part for Baltimore, and, uh, and Baltimore was dissipating uh, uh, that largesse. Part of what was striking for me when I arrived was the fact that there had been this increase in funding, but it had not resulted in, uh, in uh, an increase in the number of services and programs for kids. So, there, was, there were hardly any after-school programs. Uh, there were about 30 community schools. There were 200 schools in the, in the city. Uh, 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 the, the enrichment wasn't there. And uh, the money went to people. And uh, decisions were being made at a point where, especially in a climate, and this interacts with the conversation about uh, uh, policing, where there was a feeling that, that the schools were unruly or out of control. The, uh, uh, the, you know, the money went to people. So over a stretch of 10 years, from 1995 to 2007, you had a school system that had lost 30,000 students. It had gained roughly 2,000 adults. So uh, uh, the money went for the reduction of class size and for people to intervene with kids. And, that, that interesting question of what is the right intervention was always resolved uh, towards the one element of school systems that costs most, as in most school systems spend 80% of their budgets on personnel. So you had this extraordinary increase in resources with a reduction in the number of kids and the money still went to personnel, it did not go to services for kids. So I come in, my feeling is, and I'm gonna to need to be very fast, my feeling is that the, the system is broken and we can take some risks. Uh, uh, there's a window, and you know, part of what a leader needs to do is to figure out whether the window is there, you know, how, to, how to open it a little wider. Uh, when it's closing, uh, what other window opens up? And the window when I came in in 2007 uh, was, was very much about the, you know, a felt need on the part of the community that we needed to bring certain things together. So we put, uh, you know, we, we went in, in a direction that had four prongs that connected to each other. The first prong was about changing the dynamics of responsibility and accountability in schools in a way that, that dovetailed with what was happening around the emergence of charters. So we uh, pushed the money into the schools and uh, uh, created certain ligaments around expectations for action and, uh, and 
uh, made the kid count. As in, you lost, you lost students, you lost money. You gained students, you gained money. You now had the resources so that if you had a problem at the school level, you had a say in how you were going to use that problem. In a way, that money, in a way that began to change some of the dynamics of responsibility that I found when I got there, since so much had been about the pointing of the finger. The, the second prong was about creating choice as a component of what was happening in the system, which we we always understood was was inherently problematic in a city that had had a history of choice around the segregation, and in a city that has extraordinary constraints around the movement of kids. I mean, Baltimore, as you heard in earlier presentation, has a dreadful transportation system. There are only certain hubs, uh, and most of the kids in the city are are in overwhelmingly black communities, which are the most sort of removed from where those transportation hubs. One of the things that I found inexplicable about the unrest, the beginning of the unrest, was that if, you know, it happened at Mondaming Mall. Uh, Mondaming Mall, of course, is one of those hubs. Mondaming, Lexington, inner city, uh, inner harbor. So you know, the fact that you had uh, police in, uh, in, in riot gear at 3 o'clock in the afternoon in a transportation hub uh, uh, with six or seven schools surrounding that hub and letting kids out between 2.30 and 3 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, you know, that was a recipe for disaster. It was predictable. And uh, I, I, I don't know what happened, but I have always found it unfathomable. The, uh, the other uh, 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 challenge for us is that, uh, again, you had this huge concentration of uh, uh, especially African-American poor students in two large parts of the city. And the charter sector, which was so important to the creation of large portfolios, had complete autonomy around where to place schools, what great levels to open seats in. And part of what we were driving toward was the creation of seats that was going to begin to attract the entire population back into the schools. So that was the second prong. We closed schools and opened schools as part of that prong. We closed 26 schools in my first four years in Baltimore, interestingly enough, with very little community pushback. And, uh, uh, at the same time, we were opening 6 to 12 schools in order to create entry points for kids at the end of the fifth grade and at the end of the seventh grade, because that's when we were finding kids leaving the system in droves. The third prong was about coordination, alignment, partnership with uh, other parts of city government and with family and community and with the universities and business. And what do we, one of the things that was striking for me is that as soon as I arrived, the, uh, you know, all the other heads of government you know, came to ask for help. So interestingly, in this policing conversation, uh, my experience with police around schools in Baltimore was, was a, a complete collaboration because they felt that we had convening power that they lacked. And because of the demonization of uh, especially black males after they turned 12 in places like Baltimore, it was perceived that we had expertness in you know, how to manage uh, problems of behavior with uh, the kids that they didn't have. The board had negotiated a, a memorandum with the city police to hand over uh, school police to the city police. I stopped it. Uh, I felt that if you put city police in schools, you were going to end up with, uh, with more kids in jail as opposed to something else. The final prong was about the creation of early childhood settings. I felt that we needed to get to the kids much earlier and the ending of what had been extraordinarily tough zero tolerance policies at the schools, where in 2005, 2006, 
the school system had had 26,000 instances of suspension with a population of roughly 87,000 kids. And uh, that to me was a push out strategy. It, uh, it, it was coupled to me with, with enormous numbers of kids who were dropping out of school. So we managed to bring that number to uh, less than 10,000 over my stay in, uh, in Baltimore. And I think not coincidentally, the dropout rates uh, uh, were reduced by roughly 60% over five years. And the number of juvenile uh, 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 crime uh, incidents and arrest uh, dropped with the same percentages. Uh, I don't know what they are now, but during my time in, uh, in Baltimore, it, was, it, was, it, was, it brought enormous national attention to what we were doing around the reduction of suspensions in, uh, in the schools in ways that were always uh, deeply controversial within the city itself because the city was always split between uh, the people who were saying, you know, this is awesome, you know, you, you care about the kids and we cannot afford to lose any kid. And then the other half of the room, and it was always a split room, that was saying you're not, you're not, you're not serious and you're not allowing the good kids to learn with teachers in a, in a, in a sort of in-between place as well, where for many teachers this was the hardest part of the conversation about joining the work we were doing because they felt that without the ability to exclude, you were, the system was breaking some kind of covenant about a kind of sanctity of what needed to happen uh, in the classroom. Uh, so, uh, uh, and I'm, and I'm going to stop because otherwise I wouldn't allow you the chance to ask questions. He, you know, many, many successes, including, by the way, in 2013 in the National Assessment of Educational Progress in eighth grade reading, African American poor kids in Baltimore were third in the nation. Uh, only two points behind New York, four points behind Hillsborough. Uh, that's, that's a number that people don't quote that uh, 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 there were 21 cities in the Tudor study, 21 large cities, and you know, we were doing better with African-American poor kids than Boston, Chicago, Philadelphia, all the other large cities. That number has regressed since I, since I left. Uh, but again, when you talk about the symptomatic nature of what happens in Baltimore or the unique nature of what happens in Baltimore, if you actually isolate outcomes by who the kids are and not aggregate them, you will find a very interesting story about what's going on in educational systems in other cities. And Baltimore is not unique around uh, outcomes for African American poor kids. I think that you have four areas where you can be incredibly engaged in, the, in these questions as, uh, as we move forward. Uh, one is about funding. Uh, there are all kinds of unresolved questions about sufficiency with regards to school funding. Uh, you know, I heard Jason uh, give two sides of the story around whether money is a problem or not. I think that if you're running a school system with 80,000 kids and 10% of your kids are in foster care, uh, uh, and 2,500 of your kids are in and out of incarceration, and you cannot keep track of who's homeless because of the what should be celebrated, which is a tradition in the black community that you hold on to the kids. Uh, uh, you know, that question of you know, comparing one district to another is a little bit ridiculous. The, uh, uh, so there are questions about sufficiency that are going to be litigated in the next five years. And uh, the city will need all the help it can get. Uh, uh, there are questions of governance that I think are going to be in play around whether the state should retain uh, the partnership. Uh, there are questions about what problem solving means around policing and schools in the context of, uh, of places like Baltimore, where I think external perspectives are absolutely necessary because it is so raw and uh, difficult in those places. And finally, as in the, clay, as in the case of uh, places like California around the Vergara decision, I think that there's a host set of questions around 
uh, civil rights for kids and what does it mean around what cities and systems do that uh, where there's enormous opportunity uh, in this field. I wish you all become superintendents like I did because there is no more accelerating job around being able to connect everything that is happening in a city. We had, we had daily convening power in a way that no one in the city did. So anyway, I'll stop now and I'm sure you have lots of questions. Or not. <laughs> Right behind you? Okay. Hi, thanks uh, for doing this talk. Uh, I just want to know what factors do you think led to the reduction in suspensions? I mean, was it a change in, in, in discipline or was it having more staff members with smaller class sizes? What, what were some of those factors? I, th I think it was, a, as always, it's a combination of different things. We rewrote the code of conduct with. Uh, uh, the collaboration of many sectors of the community and, and made sure that certain things where there had been enormous discretion in the past, uh, you know, no longer allow for discretion. I felt very strongly that unless uh, an incident or misbehavior had an element of violence, kids should never be out of a school. That uh, school uh, should, uh, with support, of course, uh, work with the student, work with the family, uh, in order to have different, different interventions. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, we, we put in enormous resources into restorative justice, into partnerships. We gave uh, funding to schools uh, in order to address those issues. And even, even processes that we changed, like for example, under state law, before I arrived, uh, a school only needed to submit a out of school suspension for approval if it was longer than 10 days. Uh, as you know, just through the authority of the superintendency, I cut it in Baltimore to five days, which that little act in itself changed something. A lot of it is symbolic. I think schools uh, read signs around what leaders considered important and accountability elements sort of change in relationship in relationship to that. I have a, a nephew, by the way, who's 25 years old, who just started teaching math in a school in Newark, New Jersey, where I taught for 12 years. And, uh, and I am now so sensitive to this issue of what's happening around management in classrooms that uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly debating with him what, what should be happening with kids. And I think I've become a little bit more sensitized. But I, I still think that the obligation is to the, the, I mean, if this is about policing and safety in some ways, you know, not, there's no safer place for kids than schools. And I think that that's, that's where the kids belong. Right behind you. Um, thank you for coming in today. Um, so before law school, I, I taught in a low-income school, and I often um, remember thinking that my kids needed a lot more services than the school could provide. And I remember there was an article maybe in Washington Post about a school in Baltimore that had wraparound services. City uh, Springs in East Baltimore. Yes, and I was wondering why don't more schools and school districts have programs like that? Are there costs that I just can't see because I'm not on the ground? Does it take a lot of logistical effort, a lot of money? Like what, what you, is preventing that? You, you, only get, you only get funded on a per pupil basis. Uh, for the number of students that you have, and then you need to make it work. So you're constantly making compromises. In most school systems, you are spending most of the money on personnel. And in a, in a cultural context that is demanding small class size, uh, the, cost of, uh, uh, the costs that are available for all the things are by necessity reduced. And uh, I'll just give you an example. If you have a budget of a million dollars, and uh, you have 400 kids in your school, and you're happy having 25 kids per class, then you, know, you, have so many, you have so much more money available for something else. But if you're in a context that is demanding 20 or 15, then all that money goes away. So unless state formulas are introducing elements that 
put in money for the provision of elements of education that are outside what happens during the day around academics, that's, that's just going to be very hard. So most of what we did around wraparound, for example, we were pursuing grants like crazy, or we were, uh, the schools were making decisions about what they wanted to do with with funding, and uh, it, it was happening during the time when, when the city was also pulling back from the provision of certain things, so we were constantly having to come in and, uh, and substitute rather than, rather than add. Hi, um, I'm also interested in the question of funding in schools, and yeah. funding in schools is always a different difficult issue, especially because a lot of research shows that more funding doesn't always mean more successful schools and vice versa. Um, and you talked about when, in that period, when the schools got 50 to 60 million more dollars, they, they didn't use the money correctly because they used it to hire more personnel. Um, but I was interested in your opinion of like how, how should more money be used correctly, especially because when I think of more services for students, it often means hiring additional personnel. And then secondly, um, can you connect that to use of the increasing litigation about sufficient funding in schools? and how that's measured? Well, I think that, that it's measured differently in, in different places because this, this is about politics. This is not about, uh, you know, there's, there's no, uh, there's not agreed upon formula of how things cost. So some districts in the country, for example, are using student waiting funded. We, we did it in New York when I was a deputy there. I went and did it in Baltimore. It got done in Cincinnati, in San Francisco, many other places. The, it's not like we're figuring out this is what it costs to educate a student and that goes into the formula. We back into formulas on the basis of the money that we have. The same thing is happening in states all over the country. So part of what you see in places like New Jersey around Abbott or in New York around the campaign for fiscal equity is that there is, there is this push for something, especially in response to a court uh, mandate that increases uh, what's being given to uh, schools at a certain point in time, but then down the line that money gets reduced, the sufficiency remains the same, that money gets reduced, or, uh, or it never gets increased, uh, even though the cost of providing schooling are increasing. So, so it, it's, it's, a, it's about politics, but it's also about making certain arguments about what's necessary so that the politics happen. With regards to what's the appropriate way of funding a school, I'm not sure that what happened in Baltimore was inappropriate. What it was, was insufficient. As in, uh, you know, I'm not saying that because, because that, that is a judgment about what was happening in 2002 when by necessity the system was, was, was underfunding. Uh, what I'm saying is that I walked in with an expectation that there were going to be a set of elements in place that created a, a, a possibility for schools to be doing certain things when we understand, especially in a context like Baltimore, that, that you know, we needed to hold on to the kids all day. And those things were not in place. And uh, to put them in place was going to always mean some kind of sacrifice. And that's what we struggle with over time. And that push to throw money back into the school pockets and saying the school, to the schools, you, you decide what to do, was very much about allowing a kind of elasticity that a central system struggles with uh, so that the schools could, could do the things that they needed to do around individual kids. Behind you. Um, one thing that I, um, I, grew up in Indianapolis and I went to Indianapolis public schools and one thing that I've always kind of struggled with um, was in terms of funding in like inner city schools where um, tax breaks or property tax issues uh, where because corporate corporations are given tax breaks there's not enough money in the pool necessarily in terms of property taxes to fund the schools properly um, so kind of what are thoughts in terms of if, that, if I have that conception right, and if so, what are ways that we can shift the tax incentives such that we're making sure that our schools are properly funded? Well, that, I think that that's about the local politics of place. And, and what people in Baltimore City will tell you 
was that Baltimore City has been overtaxed around property values, as in, you know, the, the, the property rates in Montgomery County are much lower than the property rates in Baltimore City. The property values in Montgomery County are infinitely larger than the property values in Baltimore City. And in the absence of industry, uh, then you have a problem. So by the time that I entered the school system, roughly 76% of my budget was coming from the state, which made me endlessly dependent on the politics of the state. Only about 16% of my budget was coming from the city. The city kept claiming that it couldn't give us more because it was closing firehouses. It was closing uh, uh, community centers. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I felt that there was an erosion in my relationship with my last mayor, even though we were great colleagues, because, because I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give on the question of uh, what, the, what the school system needed at a time when, when the city was really struggling with, with you know, questions of what to do in neighborhoods. I felt that the, that the schools where the hub of the neighborhoods. Uh, uh, it's a much larger conversation, as in, you know, look, uh, uh, New York City just approved, uh, Baltimore City just approved a, a $30 million plan to build a youth jail, uh, at the same time that the, that the school system uh, uh, struggling like crazy to like uh, close uh, budget gaps. So, so where, where do people choose to spend the money? But, you know, it, it's, it's, a re, it's a local conversation. Uh, it's, 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 I don't think it's, it's, a, it's anything other than about where power and priorities are in, a, in, in local places. And, and if every child who's going to a local school system is poor and, uh, and of a particular category of kids and the wealth is elsewhere, then uh, you're always going to be struggling with this question of, uh, of you know, how do you, how do you grow that pie uh, to do all the things. I think we have time maybe for one more question. One more in the back. Yep. Sorry. Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you'd heard in New York City um, efforts there to create what they're calling community schools, where they kind of center services at the school for the whole surrounding community to kind of make it a central part, not just of student life, but of parent life or guardian life. And wonder, is that something that is kind of a model forward and can be replicated in other cities, do you I, think? I think that it's a, it's, it's, it can't hurt, and it's probably a really good thing. Uh, we had 30. And uh, if, if, you know, if I could have been, if I could have made 200 of them community schools, I would have. Uh, like everything else, it's about execution rather than about the idea. Uh, and, you know, like the, the symptomatic, symbolic, the Harlem Children's Zone is the symbol, the symbol of all this. Uh, it doesn't necessarily lead to improved outcomes for kids. Uh, what it, uh, what it does is, is begin to grow the ligaments that I think uh, over time might, might, might get to the right kinds of answers about what needs to be happening in communities. Again, the convening power of a school is unique. You know, you, you have the, the, uh, the, the chief of police uh, uh, call a meeting to discuss issues of community, and everybody's going to be yelling at the chief of police. I call a meeting to discuss how can we all work together to ensure safe passage for our kids. 200 people show up, and they all want to be contributors. So, you know, how superintendents and school leaders uh, use that convening power, I think it's, 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 it's a huge opportunity that is always uh, unexploited because people tend to sort of like bunker behind that role. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Thank you.